Now, some 30 years later, Chile is a far different place. Although the scars of the past are etched in stone at Santiago's Monument to the Disappeared. For the majority of its citizens, modern Chile has been called an economic miracle. In one of the fastest growing economies in Latin America, Chileans are more affluent than at any time in their history. That the more socialistic governments of the early 21st century have reaffirmed the free market reforms of the 1970s and 80s would seem to be a second economic miracle. These shoppers live in a society of single-digit inflation and relatively low unemployment. Chile has one of the highest literacy rates in Latin America. Record housing starts reflect a solid middle class and the quality of life in suburban neighborhoods like this one rivals that of North America or Europe. Chile is one of the world's major exporters of fruits and vegetables, especially during the Northern Hemisphere's winter months. Today, Chile is the second largest exporter of fresh salmon in the world. And its award-winning wine industry has become an international success. There are hundreds of bodegas or wineries in Chile. Here in the lush Colchangua Valley, south of Santiago, are the highly profitable vineyards of the Montes Winery. Locally, Montes employs more than 300 people. Alfredo Vidure is one of four partners. What we put ourselves as a goal was to produce very high premium and ultra premium wines. What we want is to have concentrated tastes and concentrated flavors. So when there's too many bunches per vine, we cut about 40 to 50% and throw them away so that the vine can concentrate. We sell in 69 different countries along the world. Exports represent 92% of what we produce. Our most important market is the U.S. And uh, then comes the United Kingdom. And then it's, uh, it's in Asia. Today, people come from all over the world to taste the wines at Montes. The general perception in the United States is that you have to pay $25 plus to get a decent Pinot Noir. And yet this one sells over there for $14 or $15 and is amazingly successful. Well, without free trade, Montes would not exist. We couldn't possibly think of operating solely for the local market because it's such a, a reduced market. One of the key components in Chile's transition from government command and control to a free market economy was another of Milton Friedman's controversial ideas. Instituted in 1981, Chile's privatized pension system dramatically raised savings. The country now boasts one of the highest savings rates in Latin America. Most workers have 10% of their salary placed in a personal retirement fund, which they own and control. The various funds are private and competitive. One of the first to join a private pension plan was Chilean businessman Alan McKenzie. I must admit I was a little tentative to begin with, and some of my friends were even more tentative. Juan Aristia was the plan's first supervisor. The pensions are 70% at least, or more, of the normal earnings of the people who were contributing. I honestly think it's the best investment I've made in my life. Uh, thank goodness I did, because it's, it's, it's made retirement a lot easier. <laughs> Nevertheless, the system is not without its critics. Concerns include high administrative fees, 
and the lack of coverage for the self-employed and low-wage earners. I, I, I don't feel it's fair to blame the pension scheme for what's wrong in economic distribution. I think that has to be solved with other policies. But even with these problems, there has been progress. Since 1990, the poverty rate has been cut in half. Milton Friedman's ideas work in practice. They are very attractive to the intellect, but the most important thing is that they are the best system so far proven for a better and greater development of societies and the people within them. The society that puts equality before freedom will end up with neither. The society that puts freedom before equality will end up with a great measure of both. In the 1970s, America is experiencing the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. President Gerald Ford gathers the best economic minds in the nation to consider options. The meeting is chaired by Alan Greenspan and includes John Kenneth Galbraith and Milton Friedman. The U.S. economy is fundamentally strong, but that strength is currently being eroded by the disease of inflation. If that disease is not checked, it will take a heavy toll including, in my opinion, the very likely destruction of our personal, political, and economic freedom. Any cure would have to be painful indeed to be worse than letting that disease rage unchecked. By now, the name Milton Friedman is well known in the halls of government. Joining us live from our San Francisco bureau is the Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman. Something and around the kitchen tables and in the living rooms of America. It's often described as a profit system, but that's a misleading label. It's a profit and loss system. One of the wonderful things about you is that when you speak, I almost always understand you. And that <laughs> <laughs> Professor Friedman, your expertise as an economist is, of course, indisputable. His appearances on national television have made him an unexpected celebrity. The long-term national security of this country will not be promoted by converting the United States into a protected enclave protected from foreign competition. He also appears in print. And I remember Catherine Graham of the Washington Post asking me to persuade Milton Friedman to be a columnist. I was a little hesitant to do it. I wrote about three or four trial columns and tried them out to see whether I could do it. He resisted. He said he didn't like assignments. Uh, and he said he didn't know whether he'd have enough to write about. And I said, Milton, you will never run out of, uh, of things to write about. I wrote to the column for 17 years, and I think that turned out to be one of the most important factors in enabling me to communicate to the public at large. He's even the subject of a serious interview in Playboy magazine. It, it really surprised me, but they initiated it, and uh, they took it very seriously. And it ended up to be an extremely effective statement of my philosophy. While his ideas are getting attention in such unusual places, Milton and Rose are about to begin yet another chapter in their life together. By late December 1976, the Freedmans have moved to San Francisco, where Milton has accepted a permanent position as senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. They are contacted by the president of the public television station in Erie, Pennsylvania, Bob Chittister, who suggests a wild idea. Three years in production, Free to Choose will illustrate Milton's philosophy in new ways that are easy to understand. On the other side of the world, in Japan, like thousands of people cooperated to make this country. This is India today. He was able to persuade me to get into this project because I feel so strongly that America is at a critical point in its history. For the past 50 years, we have been moving away from the fundamental principles that made this a great country. Milton had three ground rules. No gimmicks, 
no talking down to the audience. Because this is exactly the same kind of a factory that my mother worked in when she came to this. No pre-written script. Is that the number of handlooms roughly doubled in the first 30 years after India's independence? The free market enables people to go into any industry they want, to trade with whomever they want, to buy... Chittister recruits producers from the best of British television. 30 years later, at a London hotel where early conversations about the project were held, Gentlemen. Chittister, Michael Latham, Sir Anthony Jay, and Eben Wilson remember the good times. It's been a tad. Yes, sir. Thinking back to the time I met him, I mean, Milton was already a kind of god to me because I'd, all my life I'd wondered why I was too stupid to understand economics. And then I read his Playboy article and I thought, Oh, if this is an economics, I, that makes sense. I can understand that. And then one day in 1977, the phone rings, and I pick it up, and it says it's Milton Friedman here. And it's like saying, oh, it's the Queen here. Are you free for a moment? Um, it, it was extraordinary. My uh, first meeting with Milton and Rose, I said, look, I, I think you should know I know nothing about economics. In fact, until I arrived here, I couldn't even spell it. <laughs> We went to places that were vital to understanding what he was talking about. If you want to see how the free market really works, this is the place to come. We go to Hong Kong in its heyday, where everything's a free market. Like America a century ago, Hong Kong in the past few decades has been a haven for people who sought the freedom to make the most of their own abilities. Made a huge amount of difference to the show, because you could see it in, in action. I've often been asked, over and over and over, who wrote the script for Free to Choose? My answer is, there was no script. Program 10, sequence 29, scene 2,268. <laughs> Take, I think I had 25 or something. <laughs> One of the sequences I remember, where Milton had to operate in extremis, was in the Federal Reserve bank in New York in the gold vaults. It's all a little threatening. And we sat Milton on some gold bars. A huge pile of gold, pile of gold bars. Are. These vaults where the U.S. gold was stored provide an excellent test of where the depression originated. Isn't it true that one of the things that he most enjoyed was stopping the presses that were printing the money? That's right. Showing how you can stop inflation. Political freedom cannot be preserved unless inflation is kept in bounds. And you just say, stop. But if you don't print the money, you won't get the inflation that you stop the proximate cause. And I think that gave him more pleasure than anything else. At the moment he'd stopped inflation. What happened to all that noise? That's what would happen to inflation if we stopped letting the amount of money grow so rapidly. And there on his shoulder all the time is Rose. And she's a true academic too. She was absolutely vital. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced that without Rose, we wouldn't have got the same sort of theories. Free to Choose is broadcast in Japan and every country in Europe except France. Rose and Milton edit the soundtracks from the programs into a best-selling book. Translated into 16 languages, it sells over a million copies. Following the production of Free to Choose, the Freedmans find a long-sought hideaway outside San Francisco. The discovery of Sea Ranch is the answer to Rose's lifetime love of the ocean. Much like their beloved New England, this area along the Sonoma coast of Northern California provided Milton and Rose a quiet and peaceful place to think and work. Milton really wanted to live up on the hill, but I wanted to be on the ocean. So I could hear the waves all night long and, you know, just smell the sea air. It was heaven. Mostly, when we went on hikes, it was mostly in the redwood forest, in the hills above Sea Ranch. And in some ways, that's the best part of Sea Ranch. That's the very best part of Sea Ranch. 
don't know. It was just a relaxed life, for one thing. No speeches, no anything else. When Free to Choose is first broadcast on PBS in January 1980. Thank you very much. America's presidential campaign is already underway. Ronald Reagan is trailing President Jimmy Carter in the polls. But in November, Reagan wins in a landslide. Many think Milton Friedman's ideas may have had something to do with the result. Thomas Sowell was one of Milton's students. He is now a senior fellow with the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and a syndicated columnist. Sowell watched the election very closely. I'm convinced that Ronald Reagan could not have been elected in 1980 except for what Milton Friedman wrote in the years preceding that. That there had to be a climate of opinion which is receptive to certain ideas. I think by uh, espousing these ideas in both technical and in popular media, eventually also in Free to Choose, a television series, uh, the country became much better prepared to accept them when Ronald Reagan put forward some of them in his own inimitable and persuasive manner. After the election, Reagan asks Milton to join his Economic Policy Advisory Board, along with George Shultz, Alan Greenspan, and Martin Anderson. They were reinforcing what Reagan wanted to do. But Milton was incredibly persuasive in that role and had a lot to do with the fact that they actually passed it and they went through. Reagan limits government spending, cuts taxes, deregulates major industries, and supports a monetary policy long advocated by Milton. We should go further in reducing tax rates and making the whole system more fair and simple for everyone. But before we can do that, we must correct and control a budget system that has run amok. You can't miss the Friedman-esque characterization of the world that one hears in Reagan's speeches. Thank you. Thank you very much. The free market is an engine of economic progress, and as an ancient Chinese philosopher, Lao Tzu said, govern a great nation as you would cook a small fish. Do not overdo it. Milton has this extraordinary capability of talking to high school students and presidents of the United States in exactly the same language, the same demeanor. He is indifferent to whom he's speaking to. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put up the dumpy together together. It's the issue, the idea that is so dominant. And he did that with Reagan. He did that with Nixon. He, in fact, he's done it with everybody I know, sometimes much to their disconcertion. I have no doubt Richard Nixon was a most, was a, had the highest IQ. He was the smartest of the lot. I will not take this nation down the road of wage and price controls. However, but uh, what Nixon possessed in intelligence, unfortunately, was not matched by his character. They are really an easy way in to more trouble. If he could do it without cost, yes. But he was not willing to pay enough to stick by his principle. I am today ordering a freeze on all prices and wages throughout the United States for a period of 90 days. Ronald Reagan was altogether different. The Congress passed legislation in 78 requiring the budget to be in balance by fiscal year 1981. But just like Rodney Dangerfield, that legislation didn't get no respect. He was a very intelligent and widely knowledgeable person. But he was not an intellectual in the sense in which Nixon was an intellectual. But he had very strong principles, and he was willing to stick by them. In 1988, Professor Milton Friedman travels to Washington to receive the highest honor the United States government can bestow on a civilian. We're all here today to present the Medal of Freedom to eight remarkable Americans. The citation from Milton Friedman, teacher, scholar, and theorist, Milton Friedman restored common sense to the world of economics. 
It is for his celebration of the human spirit, as well as the brilliance of his mind, that I bestow upon Milton Friedman the Presidential Medal of Freedom. In the months ahead, Milton and Rose resume their international travels, including another visit to the People's Republic of China. The welcome is warm and friendly. Milton is invited to meet with Communist Party General Secretary Zhao Zheng. During an unusually long two-hour discussion, the topic is economic reform and the implementation of free markets in a communist nation. There is one sign the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Within a year, the Berlin Wall would fall. The Soviet Union would dissolve. And in time, China would become the world's third most active trading nation. Times are changing. Globalization. It's the central reality of our time. Of course, change this profound is both liberating and threatening to people. But there's no turning back. From Eastern Europe, you must understand that without freedom of choice, there is no freedom. To Latin America, the way we've changed people's lives is incredible. Milton Friedman was the one that started it all. And throughout Asia, Milton Friedman's ideas about the power of choice are clearly in the mainstream. There are various ways to describe Friedman's influence. But one way is to ask, has he helped many people, poor people in the world? And I just take India and China, 37% of the world's population. Hundreds of millions of people in these two countries uh, who used to live on less than $1 a day or even $2 a day are now able to live at a much more decent standard of living as a result of the reform of their economic policies toward more free market policies, less regulation, less government, and the like. But there was one person who they're more indebted to than anybody else for their great improvement in their situation. In my judgment, that person is Milton Friedman. In his own country, he remains the ever-controversial champion of the American dream. Thank you all very much. It's uh, an honor for me to be here to uh, pay tribute to a hero of freedom, Milton Friedman. He has used a brilliant mind to advance a moral vision. That vision has changed America, and it is changing the world. Of course, the two greatest enemies of... I think the impression he has, he loves to talk and he argues back and forth. One of the reasons why I am in favor of less government is because when you have more government, industrialists take it over. But if you pay attention, I think what he's doing is he's, he's teaching. Well, he was a great teacher. I always say he was the greatest teacher I ever had. He made economics come alive. It was not simply a game that clever academics played, but it was a way of understanding reality. I remember uh, doing a paper in which I uh, said at one point, either A, this will happen, or B, that will happen. And he wrote in the margin, or C, your analysis is wrong. And when I saw him afterwards, I said, uh, where was my analysis wrong? He said, I didn't say your analysis was wrong. I just wanted you to keep that possibility in mind. <laughs> so he, he was a tough one. Right at this moment, there are people all over the land, I can put dots on the map, who are trying to prove Milton Friedman wrong <laughs> at some point, or somebody else trying to prove that he's right. That's what I call influence. The principles of freedom, the principles that are involved in free to choose, are those which are most applicable to advance human civilization. And uh, you can't delve in a more important area than that. In retirement, Milton and Rose Friedman are still drawn to those places that have been home for over half a century. 
my grandfather's not gonna believe this photo. <laughs> Thank you. How does he happen to have his degrees with him? So are you a graduate student in economics? Yeah, I am a GSP student there. I'm an MBA. Where are you from? India. India. I think my ideas stuck up very well. I feel very good about them. My name is Nikolai. I'm from Russia. The uh, concept of a natural rate of unemployment is now conventional wisdom. The long argument between Keynesian and moderates has disappeared. The theory of the consumption function, permanent income, technical terms like that have become common language. They've become part of the vocabulary. So I feel very good about that. We're better off than we were 50 years ago. But we stand on the shoulders of the people who went before. But luck and chance play an enormous role in human affairs. The true test of any scholar's work is not what his contemporaries say, but what happens to his work in the next 25 or 50 years. And the thing that I will really be proud of is if some of the work I have done is still being cited in the textbooks long after I'm gone. Major funding for this program was provided by John Templeton Foundation, Gene I. and Charles H. Bruni Foundation, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Susquehanna Foundation, Dorothy D. and Joseph A. Mahler Foundation. Additional funding was provided by Barry and Terry Lind, John M. Olin Foundation, William E. Simon Foundation, Gleason Foundation, Robert E. Hanne, Fred M. Young, Jr., Randolph Foundation, Bachnowski Family Foundation, The Allison Foundation, Michael Kaiser, Brian D. Singer, America's Home Place, Inc., Chris J. Roofer, Laura and John Fisher. <laughs>